A long uniform rod of mass M and length L is supported at the left end by a horizontal axis into the page and perpendicular to the rod as shown. Now that sentence alone could cause you problems in terms of uh, interpreting this, but all that means is that what you have here is basically a screw. And were it not for this thread, which we're about to read about, this rod would be free to rotate either that way or that way. Okay, so there's some kind of hinge there attached to some apparatus. But as we continue, the right end is connected to the ceiling by a thin vertical thread so that the rod is horizontal. Express the answers to all parts of this question in terms of M, L, and G, the only allowed variables. Part A says determine the magnitude and direction of the force exerted on the rod by the axis. Part, P, part B says if the breaking strength of the thread is 2, uh, 2mg, determine the maximum distance R measured from the hinge axis that a box of mass 4m could be placed without breaking the thread. So I'll break down the interpretation of that in a second, but let's tackle part A first. Okay, so the first part of this problem is going to take the form of a statics analysis. And a statics analysis is just something you do when you consider all the forces acting on each part, each relevant part of a mass that's being held static, held in place by a series of apparatus. Okay, so a thread, a screw, whatever we decide to call this. Let's talk about all the forces that are acting on this object and where they are acting. That's what separates this from the dynamics problems you'll see earlier in your course. If I start on the right, I might find that there's a force pulling us up, okay? Keeping the right end of the rod suspended. It is pulling us up and we might call it FT for the force of the thread. Now, as I move to the left, the next thing I'm going to encounter is the force of gravity. And I'm going to consider that to be at the center of mass. I can say this because the rod is uniform. If it wasn't uniform, which means if it was lighter at one end than at the other for some reason, uh, then finding the location of the center of mass would be quite a bit more work. But because it's uniform and because this is fairly um, introductory physics, we can say that the mass might as well all be concentrated here at the center, right? So we say that there's a force pulling us down, the force of gravity, which I'll go ahead and abbreviate as mg as I usually do. Now the next thing we find is this hinge, okay, this screw we described. It's reasonable to assume that that is exerting some sort of upward force. After all, you know, something must be in equilibrium with this in order to sort of counteract the force of gravity, which may as well be at the center, hence why this is a statics problem, it is not being allowed to fall, right? So if this hinge wasn't there, obviously it would just sort of swing down and hang vertically. Whatever the case, we call this force uh, FH, let's call it, for the force of the hinge. Now actually, when we say determine the magnitude and direction of the force exerted on the rod by the axis, I guess that's the very thing we're looking for, okay? We have just named that thing FH, the force of the hinge. So keep that in mind that that's what we're looking for. And we're, we're actually able to set up a force equation for the y-axis using all of these. Uh, we don't need an x-axis force equation because there's nothing going on horizontally. But I take all those red arrows and I write them in an equation form, assuming the upward sense to be positive, and it looks something like this. The sum of all the forces in the y direction, let's say, will be equal to FH minus MG plus FT. But because this is a statics problem and because it is being held in place with no acceleration, the net force will be zero. So zero is equal to FH minus MG plus FT. If I wanted to isolate my desired variable, FH, I would just add or subtract as appropriate the other things in the equation. I would get an expression like this. MG 
minus ft is equal to fh. All right, now that's not too bad. It technically solves the problem. It gives us the idea of the solution. And m and g are allowed because I'm allowed to report m and g as variables. But ft, that's not going to work, OK? We're not being specific enough. We're being too general. We have to find another way uh, to express the forces that are in play here that takes advantage of the tension so we can solve for it like a system of equations. Now, I've already mentioned we cannot do the horizontal axis, unfortunately. I wish we could, that would, then that would be a much easier dynamics problem. But it turns out what we have to do isn't that bad. We just have to look at the torques. Now, to remind you, a torque is a force that causes us to rotate. It has a definition equal to F R sine theta. So an individual torque is what you get when you take a force, uh, such as this one, okay? You multiply it by the radius, the distance of it from your hinge arm of choice, and you take the sine of the angle between the radius vector and the force vector, in this case, 90 degrees. So that's just the definition, but let me walk it back through this problem step by step to make sure we get all the relevant information. That's just the definition. Let's select a sensible hinge to work from, to measure our radius from, and I think you'll agree that the actual horizontal axis we're interested in would be a good choice for that. This, after all, is said to be a rotating axis, and we are free to rotate either this way or that way, depending on which of these forces wins, right? Well, neither of them win, it's a statics problem, but hopefully you get the point. So our job is to analyze the forces and their position relative to my hinge arm. The very first one I encounter is the force of the hinge itself, this one right here that's supposedly pulling us up. But that's not going to cause us to rotate because its distance, the r, here would be zero. So whatever that force is, it would get zeroed out when considered as a torque force that causes a torque. So we're not going to consider that one in our analysis. But as we move to the right, the first thing we encounter is mg, basically at the center of mass. And you'll note that that occurred, in terms of given variables, a distance of L over 2, half the length from my lever arm, lever uh, hinge, rather. Now, the force is equal to mg. You can tell that left to its own devices, that downward force would cause our rod to rotate in the uh, clockwise direction, which I'll remind you by convention is negative. Okay? You'll also note that the angle between the radius vector and the force vector, I think I already pointed this out, but I'll point it out again, is 90 degrees. So let's start building out our net torque equation. The net torque on our hinge, we might as well specify that, so far is equal to negative mg, there's your f, L over 2, there's your r, and now we would do the sine of 90. But in this case, as it is for most of these cases, okay, the angle being 90, the sine of 90 is 1. A lot of people just say that torque is just fr, which is true in this case, and it will be true for the other cases in this uh, problem. Sine of 90 is 1, so we don't really need to worry about that so much, but I thought I'd bring it up. Now, we actually do encounter another force. You can tell that that force would cause us to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, which by convention is considered to be positive. That occurred at a length of L from the lever axis. So, um, goes without saying, the angle there is 90 degrees. I will add plus Ft, okay, there's my force, L, there's my R, Sine of 90, 1. I'm not going to bother writing it down. 
these are all of the torques that are relevant, all of the non-zero torques. Now, because this is a statics problem and the rod is not currently undergoing radial acceleration, angular acceleration, I can say that the sum of torques is zero. So zero is equal to, let's say, negative mgl over two plus ftl. Algebraically equivalent to FTL equals MGL over 2. I have lengths, L's, occurring on both sides in the same place, and I may cancel them out. And the denouement of that is that FT, the force of the thread, is MG over 2, half the weight. So, that's a sensible substitution to make over here. We have mg minus mg over 2 is equal to fh. And what does that say? fh is mg minus half of mg, therefore it is equal to, and I'll write it in purple to represent the fact that it's the combination of the red equation and the blue equation, just because I like stuff like that, mg over 2. And so it is finished. The hinge is bearing half the weight. And the thread is bearing half the weight. That makes sense because half that way, half that way, in balance, in equilibrium with all of it, pulling us down. Okay, now for this slightly more interesting problem, although we have done a lot of important work already. If the breaking strength of the thread is 2mg, Determine the maximum distance R measured from the hinge axis that a box of mass 4M could be placed without breaking the thread. So what we must do is pick a random place, pictorially speaking, to hang a box of mass 4M. It doesn't matter how far away I draw it. The point is, it's an unknown radius from the hinge. Hopefully that diagram is not getting too crowded, but unknown radius from the hinge. I could draw it here, I could draw it there. It doesn't really matter. It's a variable and we're gonna calculate what it should be symbolically. Okay, I was gonna say numerically, but symbolically. Okay, so the position on our diagram has no effect on what R truly has to be once I dial in all the correct variables. So, one thing we're told is that the breaking strength of the thread is 2mg. So it's reasonable to assume that the maximum distance you can place, like the further away this R is, the more weight, okay, the more torque, I guess you could say, this FT has to bear, okay, the more upward torque that thread needs to provide in order to keep the thread from breaking, to keep the thing in the static equilibrium. So, we're going to associate the maximum distance R with the maximum force the thread can put out. Let's just set FT equal to 2mg. Now let's set up our torque equation. You'll note that by putting my box here, I have created a new downward force. It's equal to 4mg, mass times acceleration due to gravity. So let's set up a new torque equation. Oh, also one more thing, just like the center of mass itself, that would cause our rod to rotate in the clockwise or negative direction if it were left to itself. So really it's a very similar setup to the one we just did. We talk about the net torques and how we will first encounter relative to our hinge at a length of L over two, our force of mg. There's our force from FR sine theta. The next thing is our r, our distance, L over 2, unchanged from last time, and don't forget the negative sign, okay? The next thing we encounter, also a negative torque, is a force, 4mg, an unknown radius, which we shall call r, looking to find out what that is, and yeah, sine of, sine of 90. Finally, 
in the positive direction, so coming in with a plus sign, will be a new force, 2 mg. Its distance, a full L, and yeah, sine of 90. So there's your net torque equation. We have given the maximum uh, allowable force to the thread. We still want the thing to be in equilibrium, so let's just set the torque equal to zero. So zero equals negative MGL over two minus four MGR, R being our variable of interest here, plus two MGL. We are good to go. We know all the variables that are mentioned, or we are looking for the one that is not. Numerically, we can clean this up. I can multiply all of the terms by 2 to clear the fraction. I will have 0 equals negative MGL minus 8 MGR plus 4 MGL. All of these terms, including the zero, if you want to think about it that way, include m. Therefore, I may cancel all the m's out. They also all include g, so we'll be canceling those out as well. We have an expression, an equation rather, zero equals negative l minus 8r plus 4l. The like terms say that 0 is equal to 3L minus 8R, just about out of space. If you've gotten this far in AP Physics, you probably know the solution already, but we can see this is algebraically equivalent to 3L equals 8R, and the radius of interest is equal to 3 eighths of the length. The last thing I want to point out is that it appears my intuition about where this radius should be, I guess I wasn't paying too much attention, uh, wasn't exactly right. The R is 3 eighths, which is actually less than half, so if I wanted to draw a good diagram, I should have put my box over here. But that just goes to show you, allowing the R to be, um, you know, variable, allows us to calculate it where it should be. So the drawing was still helpful, even if it was just a little bit inaccurate. And so I could have done a better job, but I kind of appreciate how we managed to get the correct answer anyway. It goes to show you, you don't need to know everything. Some things just work out.